Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Sarandis. Um, I run a company called Sausalito Technology Advisors. Um, we offer marketing agency services, especially content that drives lead generation activities and growing small and medium businesses. I'm super, super excited to host this uh, webcast on the African logistics industry. Even the panelists probably don't know <clears throat> that my father founded a, a software distribution company specifically for distributors and later uh, warehousing uh, in the 80s and 90s that he eventually sold. So the logistics industry is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce my uh, expert panel, starting with Shamandra. He's the commercial director of Dovetail Business Solutions. Um, all my panelists have about 25 years of experience, so we'll skip that part. Um, he has his, his experience is in, is in software with multinational companies and various logistics and, uh, and supply chain verticals. He also lectures at universities and he co-authored the book that's on his right hand shoulder, but because he's in full screen, he can't see it. It's called the book on logistics software. Um, as Dovetail is a company I've been, I've been acquainted with for more than 10 years, really great group of uh, team of people and probably the largest, um, a supplier of logistics software um, on the African continent. Uh, Jeff is, a, is an expert in logistics, um, aviation and African affairs with over 25 years of experience in Asia, Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. He's currently director with DHL Africa based in South Africa. Um, while Shamandra is an old friend, Jeff's a fairly new friend. Uh, we met in January, maybe late last year after he had had a, um, uh, a two week trip to Ethiopia where he tells a story about meeting the two Jacks in a lift, one being Jack Ma and the other being Jack Dorsey of, of Twitter. Um, so he has some very, very deep experience and prior to the lockdown and, and all, all, everything that's happening now, he was spending more of his time in Africa than he was in South Africa. Uh, thirdly, Bruce Tilley, he's the founder and, and CEO of Pet, uh, Pet, sorry, Pet Distribution Operator Cube Root. Um, he has 26 years of experience in distributing and wholesaling of uh, pet food and pet accessories. And Cubert also offers 3PL services to major brands sold in, pet, in, in the pet specialty channel in South Africa. Um, as I mentioned, uh, all of you are muted and the pet panelists have now unmuted, but please feel free to, um, to open the chat and, and, and chime in with, um, with any kind of comments or any questions that you have throughout the presentation. And we'll also have plenty of time for Q&A after the presentation. For now, I'd like to hand over to Shimandra with the agenda. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, we try to uh, create a, sort of just some feedback and provide some information on what's happening in the logistics industry in South Africa and um, also across different regions in Africa during the COVID crisis. Um, you know, what, did, what are people doing while we still in lockdown? Um, is it all doom and gloom? Are there any positivities? Um, how is technology affecting um, the current situation and future plans for logistics and supply chain uh, organizations? Um, you know, what, what are the different mindsets? What are people looking at doing differently uh, for future similar type of crisis? Um, and where do these opportunities lie for the, for the continent? So without uh, further delay, we can, we can kick off. Um, I think the first thing we're looking at is, you know, what are the trends in the lockdown? I mean, all you guys are in supply chain, you have your own logistics uh, businesses, everything from a mix of uh, Korea and warehousing uh, to road transportation. Um, and what we saw during April is, uh, you know, COVID threw a lot of the businesses in turmoil. Logistics was severely impacted. You know, in South Africa, road transport is still sort of the, the choice to move um, the goods. It's the highest volume movement. And um, this was, it was a huge pressure place because of all the restrictions. Um, and even for people that could operate, there were still the restrictions around um, not enough uh, transportation services to support the retail and the pharmaceutical industries that were considered essential trans uh, services. Um, you know, you also had air transportation grounded and so forth. So, you know, we looked at our client base and I think we saw probably between 70 and 80% of operators during April were working 30% or less than 30%. In fact, we had some clients that did zero trading in the month of April. Um, however, the good news is we did see from May as uh, some of the restrictions were lifted in level four. 
um, clients who are getting back to work, but with many businesses still being closed, you're not going to have that full volume. So I think we did a, a check in the last week and we saw as we're coming towards the end of May um, that uh, volumes are beginning to pick up. Uh, so you see, you know, especially around retail, the automotive environment in spare parts, um, e-commerce uh, fully opened up in the last few weeks. So those are all good, good positive signs. But during the Amanda, crisis, if I could just add on to that. Yes. Um, what, what we found that uh, one of the sort of key differences between business as, as usual and, uh, and from the lockdown is the difference in volumes that we had to shift from day to day. I mean, we were going from one day doing four or five times on our daily volume to doing 25% of it the next day. And so to be able to try and accommodate all of our customers in the very short time frame proved to be very difficult. And so we had to be very adaptable and, and flexible in, in how we deliver to customers. And, and I think you raise a key point. I mean, we, we spoke to a few clients and, and if you don't have that volume, you know, it's very difficult to be flexible or adaptable. And some customers just made the tough decision not to operate. So even though they might have had some percentage, so, you know, I think Bruce, you're one of the, the few that managed to get, get through some, some of that uh, April volume, which is good. Um, you know, we also saw clients uh, trying to do different things in April. You know, you're not allowed to deliver sort of non-essential goods. Um, and if that's not your focus, uh, some clients did say, well, can they get into that market? You know, how do they, they try and deliver some pharmaceuticals? How do they deliver PPE equipment? Um, we also looked at people trying a different focus. You know, we had a few clients selling PPE and related products just to, just to get some revenue into the business so that it's not sitting at zero or 5% or 10% revenue. Uh, so we must say, you know, South Africans do have a good mindset when it comes to trying to eke out and, and maintain their businesses. Uh, out, of, out of the box thinking, um, which helped them survive that month of April, um, which is good. Um, I think as we move towards the 1st of June, uh, speaking, just liaising with different stakeholders in the, in the environment, um, a lot of companies are seeing in the foreseeable future that there will be an uptick in volumes in the coming months. Um, you know, all industries are pretty much open from 1 June and slowly you'll see you know, more manufacturing, more import of goods, uh, but more warehousing and people buying more product, um, especially with seasonal changes in the weather, there'll be more retail movements and related products. So all of that adds to increasing volume. So um, surprisingly, although April, May was tough, um, there are some companies that see more the positive side to say, hey, business will continue um, as much as this current um, tough times and doom and doom. And I think I think it's a it's a, it's a good point. I think that you know, business will will pick up significantly again. But I think the next six months are going to be a real tester for a lot of companies, uh, in particularly in the distribution where there's a down trading. Uh, people are looking, you know, price related deals more and more, um, and that becomes more difficult for companies that are delivering products. So uh, I think I think. I think it's a pos positive A, but I think the next uh, the next four to six months are going to be quite difficult. Thanks, Bruce. Jeff, uh, do you want to take us through the next section? Thank you very much, uh, Shmandra and uh, Kurafun. What a topical uh, discussion, and it's coming at the right time. So just uh, on what we're seeing there, um, the map of Africa, it's South Sub-Saharan Africa. It's just showing us where we are in different countries uh, in terms of lockdowns, some countries are having a curfew, some other countries are having a tough, tough, tough uh, uh, lockdown. But what are the implications for the people in uh, logistics who are the, um, uh, our guests and delegates here? Yeah, that is what is the question. So within Africa, there's something called the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement that is supposed to kick in in um, in uh, July, but with what is happening now, we are having uh, lockdowns across the board, meaning that uh, it will be delayed. So we're seeing a uh, disruption within the supply chain, we're seeing our uh, borders and airports closed, 
meaning that most of the people cannot move uh, various goods and uh, raw materials, especially from China. So this supply chain fracturing, meaning that uh, the, the modes of transports are being changed. For instance, you know, uh, right now, if we look at the statistics for January, uh, the, the number of flights, number of passenger flights has declined by uh, 94%, yeah? What uh, the flights that were flying within Africa in January compared to now is declined by six, uh, by 94%, uh, meaning only 6% is flying. So it puts strain in terms of the, the supply chain uh, of uh, goods, you know, uh, e-commerce is quite big, uh, people importing raw materials out of China. So we're seeing that being affected. Yeah, the, the rail line linking most of the countries in East Africa. So we're seeing that um, uh, being, being affected. We saw companies uh, doing what we call a pivoting. So we're pivoting and repurposing. For instance, in South Africa, we saw net, uh, net florists moving into online grocery deliveries because that's the new norm that is coming out of this. Other than now, not many people are buying flowers right now people under lockdown were buying uh, goods and uh, the online business, if I was talking to, uh, to Craig the other day and what is happening in Europe and in, uh, in the States where they are seeing it is Christmas every single day because the volumes have shot on uh, online uh, purchasing. So we're seeing these trends of uh, digital tracking. So the, what I'll call the Uberization of logistics. So there's a massive increase uh, on B2B uh, uh, business and uh, B2C. Rail is also coming into being because uh, sea freight is quite a uh, thing. So we're seeing within Africa uh, a rail uh, thing. But the key point that we need to watch, which presents for the opportunities and threats, is the supply chain fracturing. There are some positives uh, coming out of there in terms of that small companies can start producing goods that they can supply to markets within the region and markets within South Africa. So that's, uh, that's what this slide is talking about. Thank you, Shumendra. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I think um, as we look at that, Jeff, and all the restrictions where they can't be moving goods and people are not able to trade over the last sort of month or two, um, you know, what, what have people been doing in terms of technology? So instead of just sitting back, we've seen some clients actually use the opportunity to upgrade their systems. And I'm not just talking about you know, logistics or where else transport. People have looked at the ERPs and the CRM systems. And uh, many of them have said, okay, let's prepare for the future. Uh, let's be proactive while we have this downtime. We still have resources available so we can do an upgrade without affecting day-to-day um, -day operations. So I think that was also a bit surprising from our side when we had a um, number of clients actually contact us. But like I said, it's not just dovetail. It was general when we speak to other service providers with different solutions. So, so that was actually quite good to keep people productive and keep IT generally going and stable. So they're just preparing to know once volumes pick up, once they're all back at work, they have good, solid, robust systems to actually uh, move with the times. And I think the, the, the point that Jeff made and Chumandra that you make on e-commerce, um, we were associated with the e-commerce business as well in the, in the pet industry. And we've seen tremendous growth in that business. And um, whilst e-commerce is always growing, you know, over the last few years it grows far, far greater than any other sector in the, in the market. South Africa traditionally has had a big barrier for e-commerce and that's the number of shopping centers we have per capita and it's second highest to Dubai. But from this lockdown where a lot of people are now going online, we've seen a big upswing in the, in, in the e-commerce side of our business. Uh, and that's opportunity for, for logistics companies and distribution companies because there will be tremendous growth in that. I mean, we still, we still had a three or 4% of what, of, of the retail business online, but um, in the US and I know specifically in the pet trade, it's around 30%. So that's the opportunity for, e-commerce in this country, um, and then obviously the, the courier and distribution businesses that go alongside with that. So big opportunities there. Yeah, and I think um, as companies move more towards becoming e-com retailers or enhancing those services rather than physical stores, um, it does open up, you know, people were speaking about dark warehouses a few years ago, but it hasn't really taken off, especially here in South Africa. Um, but you know, in the last month or two, we've probably had dark restaurants. You know, everyone's in the 
past month, you've been able to buy food only online and have it delivered to you. You can't go to the, do a pickup or you can't go and sit in a restaurant. And that's pretty much a dark type of warehouse and dark type environment where it's manufactured and you just order online and it's delivered to you. Um, and, you know, that brings about the need for solutions like mobility and contactless delivery. Um, and mobility is great. Everyone loves the EPOD and the sign on glass. But with COVID, no one's going to hold a pen and then give it back to the driver or take a pen from the driver. So that's very dangerous right now. So, you know, how do we get smarter on that? You know, um, you know we've been looking at things like pin codes and focusing on um, photos. Uh, so when you do a delivery, you can take a photo of that and that becomes an acceptable POD. Um, and that's slowly going to become the norm um, in, in the market. You know, Jeff, are you in DHL? I'm sure you guys have probably seen similar things and similar requirements that you need to deal with. Jeff, I think you muted there. Uh, Shamendra, absolutely. We've seen that uh, that trend. So uh, personal hygiene has become quite important. So no longer signing on on glass, but we already we've pivoted and using uh, uh, photographs um, as part and parcel of the POD uh, regime, and it's working very well. Yes. Bruce, I know in your own business you've also looked at different solutions in terms of technology to try and um, eliminate too much human interaction and. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think well specifically with COVID nineteen, you know, like with every company, we have to comply with what the regulations that they stipulate in terms of being able to trade. Um, but we have also used this opportunity for uh, you know route optimizing, and because of, as I mentioned our fluctuations and volumes, um, we we use a route optimizer to our advantage where we can save money and make sure the, the trucks are full going out on a daily basis. So it, it's helped a lot like that and, and fast tracking what we had planned in a, in a paperless society, perhaps in a year or two's time, it's bringing those timelines forward very quickly because you know, people don't want to touch anything. And, and I think it's also a good thing you know, from an environmental point of view and from all these things that impact on, on our businesses, we all need to be cognizant of the fact that we need to tread lightly on the planet and we need to optimize our businesses in, in everything that we do. Good. Thank you, Bruce. So I think as we move out of the uh, severe restrictions where there's very little trading happening, it has given um, you know, a lot of time to business owners and stakeholders to think, you know, what do we do differently? Um, and and there's some of the things that's probably was the right thinking that needs to be rethought. So, you know, uh, we've picked up, for example, um, there was a major focus in the last few years around just in time inventory. Um, people were reducing stock holding in the warehouse, reducing the number of uh, warehouses they have. And, um, and that was great because that opens up and eases up and frees up cash flow. So, there was absolutely the great things to do and to continue doing. Uh, but what it has shown is that um, you know a disruption like COVID-19 can have an unaffected uh, and unexpected uh, effect in just-in-time planning. Um, it's it just doesn't work in this kind of scenario because you're out of stock very quickly. And as Jeff explained, with the difficulty in accessing raw materials because the borders are closed, um, you know you know ships aren't allowed to travel, planes can't move around. Um, if you can't get raw materials to to a factory. You can't actually manufacture anything. Um, so we've seen uh, major impacts in retail and FMCG uh, clients where they've got stores open, but they just don't have any more uh, stock available because they just can't get the stock into the country. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, the guys saying, okay, how do we, we look at this? And um, some of the industry um, sort of gurus and experts have been thinking, okay, you can continue with your, your sort of just-in-time strategy, but perhaps you should look get um, increasing your stock holding by three to five percent so nothing radical but just a slight shift in what they were probably planning to do over the next five or ten years and just to create a buffer stock holding so that you have enough to maybe support two or three months of uh, sales if you have this kind of impact again in the next uh, few years um, we've also seen companies uh, having you know global companies having to reevaluate their supply chain um, um, fulfillment centers, you know, 
where even locally customers were looking at central DCs, consolidating multi warehouses into one central DC and distributing from there. You know, how do you, how does that work? You know, if you, if you have a DC in Durban and you need to support stores across the country and you're not allowed to go across the province, but well, you can't actually get your goods into your stores. Um, so customers had to, or logistics and warehousing guys had to react very quickly to set up temporary facilities in different provinces just so that they could service their stores. So again, you know, having a central DC is great because it's, it's less cost, easier to manage, you know, uh, less people, et cetera. But you've got to have that flexibility that uh, you can actually set up a gym facility and do distribution from different regions. Um, and I think some of the positive that comes out of that is a great news for anyone in PPO warehousing and distribution services, because um, no one can just go out there and buy a new warehouse in a month or two months time. But if you're a 3PL company, you know, you've got space, you've got warehouses, you've got the infrastructure in place, and you can offer these services as becoming the um, sort of support structure to retailers, FMCG, or any company just looking for some extra space to keep their buffer stock. So we seen that as a positive to say, hey, if 3PL companies can attract these services, you know, maybe they increase their volumes and maybe it helps offset some of their losses from the first quarter and helps them pick up for the rest of the year. So again, hopefully there's some positive coming out of this uh, tough challenges. Yeah, Shemandra. Sure. Sorry, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, so Shemandra, I think that the just in time and and, uh, and industry holding is a bit of a moving target, and as we've seen specifically, you know, what happened a couple of years ago with with a focus on just in time and reducing your holding and improving your cash flow. Now you need to be flexible with that because the, you know you can't manufacture something if there's one component missing in that manufacturing line. And so I think a lot of a lot of companies are focusing more on how do they manage their stock at just in time or stock holding basis, and that view changes uh, quicker than you, know, you might look at it in a few months or or, or on a, a, a semester basis. But the um, the, the speed at which you can adapt, I think, is going to be the, the future of, of the success. You know, the companies that can't adapt quickly to market changes and market dynamics will struggle a bit. The companies that can adapt will be will be a bit more successful. And as far as the 3PL service is concerned, I think everyone's looking at diversifying their businesses in some way to get more revenue in. I mean, I think that's a, that's yeah. been a standard practice with our economy over the last few years as it's continues to struggle and specifically now with the with the down you know with the negative growth i mean the banks are looking at between six and ten percent down on the on the gdp um more and more business will look at diversifying and how can they get the assets to sweat more and uh and offer you know more three pl top services good thanks please Greg, I think you want to something, Greg? yes i find the whole uh, git inventory uh, subject is fascinating, not just within the supply chain, but if you look at the American hospital um, uh, healthcare system, any given winter, they have 95% occupancy of hotel beds and ICU, ICU, ICU units in, um, in, in winter. So every January and February, um, especially in the cold states, you have full, full capacity of hospitals. Then you have a pandemic and it becomes a real problem. And I think we saw, and Jeff shared on the weekend, some, some media, I think it was out of The Economist, about how the people are rethinking that buffer, that GIT buffer, maybe we put two or 3% or more um, of buffer into the supply chain to, uh, uh, to, to manage risk, right? Thanks, uh, thanks, Greg. So, you know, the other thing we look at clients, you know, um, imagine you're a customer of 200, uh, or a company with 200 vehicles, um, and you haven't been able to trade for pretty much the month of April and May. That's 200 cost centers, 200 revenue generators that's been bringing in zero revenue. Um, and you're probably still paying for the lease agreements, HP on those vehicles, and the driver salaries. Um, so that becomes quite, uh, quite tough to manage. Um, and how do you change that? So we see that uh, customers are saying, okay, should we be outsourcing? Should we look at more an outsourcing model rather than owning all the vehicles? Um, and again, that's just, you know, different scenarios for different types of transporters and uh, different options. But in the career world, um, 
I think if I refer back to the uberfication that Jeff was talking about, you know, it's probably heading more to that. We are looking at a case study in Dubai where their road traffic um, and transport authority has um, sort of career agreements with the taxi industry. So instead of setting up a whole different career uh, infrastructure and vehicles and drivers and costs, they just make use of the taxi service to support the, the career deliveries. Um, Aramex was also an interesting one in Jordan and Saudi Arabia. They made a decision to do something called um, Aramex Fleet, which is sort of a crowdsourcing module that allows them to scale up or down depending on um, the need for vehicles and depending on peak volumes, etc. So, you know, they could have two, three hundred vehicles or a thousand at any point in time, and they don't have any of the associated costs. So they're just outsourcing all of those deliveries. So, you know, it's just a different way of thinking, different way of planning for the future. Uh, you don't have to own everything if you want to be one of the top logistics uh, service providers. Yeah. And that's really Lucy, to the point about, it, about being flexible in your business and, and how do you cope with the changing environment quite quickly. I think these are, these are all the options that all companies need to look at in the future and, and use those assets in their businesses. Right. Good. Yeah, and so in terms of different, uh, different things, I think everyone's been looking at their businesses and saying, hey, how do we use this opportunity to really think and restructure the business we have to train? That doesn't matter what type of environment you're in. You know, how do we, how do we operate on a day-to-day -day basis? How do we work with partners and suppliers? Um, We've all had to go very quickly into remote working, and how's that working out? You know, I can I can talk from the dovetail side. We have about forty-five plus uh, people working remotely, and we have people in mostly in Johannesburg, but also different provinces and a couple in different countries. Um, so we have found, strangely enough, um, everyone's telling us the feedback from staff and management says they just feel they're more productive. Um, the meetings we find are more focused, so there's very little waffle when we get onto these uh, meetings. Um, which means decisions are made quicker. So everyone seems to be doing their homework before they get onto a meeting, whether it's a meeting internally, whether it's a meeting with a customer or project meetings. Um, and I think that's, that's really good. So, you know, I think you need the right systems behind to support uh, the process so you can measure what you're doing um, and you can take the right actions if things aren't working out. Um, and at the end of the day, we're also not saying you've got to get away from face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you know, nobody wants to lose a personal touch. Uh, you want to still meet your clients, but maybe it's not as often. And maybe you do more video calls with customers. You do more events like this. You share more with the customer. Um, in fact, I think this morning we are talking internally. We've probably had more interaction with our clients over the last sort of month on a more frequent basis than we had over the last sort of 18 months where we were trying to set up face-to-face -face meetings and go and physically meet the clients where it's probably easier to get five or 10 minutes with a customer remotely than getting a half an hour, an hour of their time because they're all so busy. Um, so yeah, we just saying once all restrictions are lifted, we're able to travel, how do we get, how do we take, uh, you know, full benefit of being able to work remotely and not change too much of what's currently happening today? Uh and I think, I think that is the new norm in the future. I mean, if you just look at what Facebook have said, that within the next five years, they'll have no more offices. Everybody will re work remotely. The same with Twitter. Yeah. Um, in our little business, you know, all of our admin staff, all, uh, you know, and all the marketing and, and the finance, everyone works remotely. No one is in the office anymore. And it works, it works well. You, to your point about your, you have a very structured meeting now before you sit and meet and you would, kind of spitball for the first 20 minutes. Now you don't do that. So you're a bit more productive in terms of, of the meeting structure. I heard a comment today, in fact, that they said working from home is becoming um, old fashioned because it's work from anywhere. And, uh, and that's quite true, really. I mean, what, you, know, you, know, you can work from anywhere if you're in a remote environment, which it's quite a good point. Um, but I, I'd just like to talk about this, this remote and losing the, the, the people touch for a second. Uh, in our business, we um, we introduced a scorecard system that uh, Robert Kaplan developed in the States a few years ago, and it's it's a bit American. So, Greg, apologies to you, but um, it's it, it it works on a, on a vision and a mission. And what it does for the company is because you 
are not together. Everyone's working with, with the same strategic values in mind. Uh, um, and it kind of brings together. We go right down to level that everyone has their own scorecard. The company has a scorecard. It's a five-year plan with milestones for each and themes for each year. But we're all driven towards the same goal and in the same strategy. So um, it becomes very easy to conduct meetings this way because we're all thinking the same way. We all know what we have to do. We all know what we have to achieve year one, year two, year three. And it's, it's great for remote working because you're not explaining where you're going and what you want to do as a company. And we, we introduced this a year ago and obviously it really helped us now um, with the remote working. People working, you know, all moving in the same direction and doing and doing what, what we set out to do. So, you know, whilst there's a lot of negativity around this COVID-19, there's also some positive that comes out about it, of the strategy of the business and how to adapt and how to work remotely and, and how to work together. So it's for, from, from our point of view, that's been a tremendously positive aspect in our business. Yeah, I just wanted to share a bit of uh, some anecdotes uh, with uh, uh, work from home uh, phenomena uh, within our uh, business. So where the strong um, fiber connection, internet connection, we've actually seen productivity increasing. Uh, for instance, uh, in Kenya, in Ghana, uh, Rwanda, where people are clearing uh, goods, uh, working with customs because they've got EDI interface with customs, but the, the number of clearance uh, per hundred is actually shot up uh, phenomena. Uh, doing that, but the people are working from home, so they remove commute time, uh, they've removed road rage, you know, they're just moving from their bedroom to, to the office, uh, uh, in the lounge or something like that, and they're working. So we've seen that, that our business has already been disrupted, that going forward, we have more or less like a hybrid, but uh, most of the, uh, the, the background functions will be done from, uh, from home. We're already seeing uh, huge increases and in positives around uh, productivity, which is, which is uh, amazing. But the key is you must have uh, the requisite technology. The technology is actually important because uh, that's what you leverage on. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Jeff. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shamandra. So uh, this slide is just linking to what we've been talking about uh, from uh, Bruce and uh, Shimantra, uh, in terms of what are the implications? Because it's pointless for us to have this conversation without saying where are the opportunities, what are the implications and opportunities for us? And uh, based on the trends that we, we've been talking about, we're seeing the last mile online sales. Uh, Bruce uh, could see his smile as he was talking about this uh, South Africa taken to Dubai in terms of the malls. But now we've seen an acceleration due to this pandemic that now we need to move. We've actually had to purchase in Nigeria 300 uh, extra motorbikes to cover for the online business that has come up the past two months. So because of traffic jams in Nigeria, motorbikes are easy to maneuver around. So we've, we've already done, uh, done that because it's, it's shown by over 80% in terms of the online sales. So that online sales fulfillment is actually key now uh, the, the COVID pandemic is actually a great equalizer and it's accelerating what we wanted to take it step by step, baby steps, but now uh, things have been disrupted. So we're seeing that uh, and you'll see it um, changing in South Africa also. We predict that this is what's gonna happen. We'll see a rise because once you've tested the, the experience around online as, uh, sales fulfillment where you just at the comfort of your house, you just order goods and like checkers 60-60 and a few minutes they're, they're delivered. It's, it's just amazing. You say, why should I go to the mall and queue and, and uh, do social distancing and uh, the, the works, yeah? So, but the key is now we need to have web plugins for logistics players, yeah? Linking to the web stores. That is important so that there is that interface, that interface is, uh, is important. Many businesses are not looking at rail transport. Yeah, There's been a massive investment within the Africa rail network and it's something that is developing that uh, right now they're looking at linking uh, Kenya with uh, Ethiopia because Ethiopia 
is landlocked because Ethiopia has been growing around nine to 10 percent. Um, uh, so we're seeing uh, that. So there's an opportunity there for all transport and logistics players to incorporate uh, rail into their solutions. Please, we urge you to look at uh, the rail. It's actually a sleeping giant and there's massive opportunities. And the last point uh, in terms of opportunities is this disruption within the supply chain. Yeah, Again, there must be that optimization that Bruce was talking about and for these changes, we're seeing new markets coming up, new manufacturing apps. Um, watch out for v Vietnam, watch out for India, watch out for Ethiopia. You know, Ethiopian airlines, the people, they're now manufacturing, they're starting uh, mid-June, manufacturing ventilators, and they'll be linking them to the, uh, to, so once they've manufactured them, they'll put them on their planes. They've uh, repossessed, uh, repurposed, uh, nine of their planes. So now they've got 20 of their aircraft uh, 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 doing cargo. So they're moving into cargo because cargo is still allowed within within the countries while under lockdown. So they've said rather than their planes to be parked, let them utilize them for cargo and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's happening. Then the last point that I want to talk about is the strategic alliances within the airlines because we are going to see lots of airlines are crashing in the, in the market. Some of those that are grounded will never come back, yeah? But we've got the big ones, like Ethiopian Airlines that are assisting the small ones and say, we are the big brothers, we can help you. Look at what we've done with Five or Ted. Now we're doing our ventilators, we're moving. Up. Ethiopian Airlines have got five of their planes that are sp spending time just in Europe and just flying between China and, uh, and, uh, and Europe. So we're, we're going to be seeing more of these strategic alliances with the, with the airlines moving uh, uh, groceries, uh, moving PPEs, masks, it's, 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 it's huge because we learned from the tissue uh, situation, the toilet paper situation, that the supply chains can be disrupted in no time, yeah? And now you need to be closer to, uh, to market. So these are the opportunities and we must uh, strive to, uh, to capture these ones and seize them while they are, they are still there. Because this pandemic has actually equalized lots of things and we must leverage and take advantage of them. Thanks, Jeff, that's good, good insights. Thank you. So yeah, I think, uh, thank you everyone for listening. I think Greg, I'll head back to you. Uh, so you can just do a roundup and see if there's any questions, et cetera. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, that was, I mean, my mind is blown. That was such a, a, a data and information rich presentation. I'd like to turn over to the to the guest panelists or sorry the guests to uh, I mean I, you can either unmute yourself and ask a question or put it into the chat. Um, normally there's an awkward silence of about thirty seconds, so I'll, I'll ask the first question. Um, um, Woolworths, I can go on the Woolworths website in South Africa, and I did on Saturday, and they said fantastic, we can deliver to you on Thursday. On Sunday morning, I went to the Checker Sixty Sixties app. I ordered a basket of goods and actually had to interrupt my yoga session because they came in 45 minutes. What's the difference? Why is, why is Checkers able to get us so right and what we're able to get us so wrong? Greg, I think, uh, I think it all depends on what, what the back end of the, of the e-commerce platform is. You know, if you're, not, if you're not connected to the right courier type of, of, of services and those are done through the API from the, from from the programming of the online or the e-commerce business to right to the courier levels, um, you, you know, if that's not an automatic function, you're going to get, get delays on it, and it could be a cost factor. So, um, you know, the quicker you get your the quicker you get your delivery, generally the more expensive it is. Um, so, the, you know, those are the two sort of factors that will determine how quickly you get uh, you get your delivery. Um, I know from our point of view, you know, anything in the greater Johannesburg area, we'd like to have it there at least by the next day. And, and, and that seems to be the, the, the norm. Anything quicker than that, you'll pay a bit more for, um, or you need to put more volume through it, or you need to look at how your APIs are set up and how you select the courier is that a delivery. Yeah, uh, Greg, I totally agree with uh, what Bruce is saying, but one of the things that we've seen uh, in logistics that it's easy to work on the technology side, but yeah. what is tough is actually change management, yeah? So to answer your question, it's linked to, to the change management, yeah? 
uh, who are your suppliers, yeah? Uh, have you set matrices in terms of how are you going to, uh, to measure? Have you done uh, work studies and so forth? So it's the change management aspect of that one. Everyone wants to do online and so forth, but uh, the proof of the pudding is now when, uh, when you need to work on the change management. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I've been in Silicon Valley forever, and uh, we always say to people, it's like, yeah, what can we do with this, with AI and delivery and last mile, whatever it is. And it's like, you know what? The technology is easy. The change management, that's the hard part. That's what we always say. Because there's always a tech solution out there. It's just a matter of price and, and, and delivery. The change management is very tough, a very tough challenge. I think one other point is also, depending on where the fulfillment centers are, will depend on where you are to get that delivery. So, you know, if you're willing, if you're ordering from Woolworths, it might come from Cape Town, for example, or wherever the case may be. So it may, you might not know where that performance center is. And so that's how it could take longer. And my question for Jeff, um, and anybody can chime in with questions at this point in time. You mentioned at the very beginning of your comment that the African trade uh, treaty Presumably, that's been negotiations for years. But, I'm, but you know, you and I have both been on these Africa.com webcasts, which are fantastic. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard, maybe I missed it, but I haven't heard any commentary on what's happening with this treaty. Is, is it going ahead for July, or is this pandemic put everybody else, uh, put, put you know, other priorities in front of, of trade treaties? Thanks, Greg, for that question. We actually had a, a logistics uh, meeting this morning at uh, 10. And this was uh, a discussion with people from the World Customs Organization and the, the AU, you know, today is Africa Day. So there was uh, around that discussion. But I can tell you from all the experts that were there that we, we are going to have a delay of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement because of what is happening. Because we're seeing most of the countries turning inward now and there's lots of protectionism. Yeah? And by the way, with this agreement, the, the, the issue is, do you open uh, the markets and increase intra-African uh, trade, but lose on some of the, um, uh, the tariffs and uh, revenues that the countries rely on? So most of the countries are saying it's not yet ready. It was supposed to go in July. But I can tell you there will be some, uh, some delays uh, around that, given what has been happening, because the countries, as you saw from that map, going to open uh, is lockdowns at different uh, different points of uh, points of view but um, many countries have already signed so 34 countries have already signed for, for the agreement but uh, definitely it's going to be delay, uh, delayed July the July one start is is an unstarter now yeah well if there's no further questions at this time uh, feel free to uh, um, I'm talking to the guests now to send questions through, through to us separately. Um, but we are out of time. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Shamandra, uh, for all the efforts you put into this presentation, all the intelligence that you brought to it. Uh, for the guests, I will be sending out, um, I will be sending out the recording within the next uh, couple of days. And you can feel free to share that um, uh, with, your, with, with, your, with your colleagues. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you, thanks, Greg. Thank you thanks, very everybody. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon.